Welcome back. Here's The Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 4, Part 1. A Prisoner. We had gone perhaps ten miles when the ground began to rise very rapidly. We were, as I was later to learn, nearing the edge of one of Mars's long-dead seas, in the bottom of which my encounter with the Martians had taken place. In a short time we gained the foot of the mountains, and after traversing a narrow gorge came to an open valley, at the far extremity of which was a low tableland upon which I beheld an enormous city. Toward this we galloped, entering it by what appeared to be a ruined roadway leading out from the city, but only to the edge of the tableland, where it ended abruptly in a flight of broad steps. So, John Carter rides with the Martians up the edge of the crater, which turns out he later learns to be one of Mars's long-dead seas. Uh, they come to the foot of the mountains and travel through a narrow, narrow valley, a uh, narrow passageway into an open valley where there's a plateau upon which is an enormous city. Uh, they come up to the ruined roadway which ends in a flight of broad steps. Upon closer observation I saw as we passed them that the buildings were deserted and while not greatly decayed had the appearance of not having been tenanted for years, possibly for ages. Toward the center of the city was a large plaza and upon this, and in the buildings immediately surrounding it, were camped some nine or ten hundred creatures of the same breed as my captors, for such I now considered them, despite the suave manner in which I had been trapped. So, uh, as he's passing the buildings, John Carter sees that they look like they've been deserted for a really long time, years or, or centuries even, and uh, they come into the middle of the city, into a large plaza, where there's about nine hundred other Martians, uh, roaming around. Um, so, with the exception of their ornaments, all were naked. The women varied in appearance, in appearance but little from the men, except that their tusks were much larger in proportion to their height, in some instances curving nearly to their high-set ears. Their bodies were smaller and lighter in color, and their fingers and toes bore the rudiments of nails, which were, entire lacking, which were entirely lacking among the males. The adult females ranged in height from ten to twelve feet. The children were light in color, even lighter than the women, and all looked precisely alike to me, except that some were taller than the others, older, I presumed. So he sees these other Martians, they're all naked, except they have ornaments on their bodies. Uh, the women are slightly smaller than the men and lighter in color. Their tusks are larger, which curve almost up to the top of their ears and um, they're about 10 to 12 feet tall. The children are all very light in color and there doesn't seem to be much difference between them other than that some are taller. I saw no signs of extreme age among them, nor is there any appreciable difference in their appearance from the age of maturity, about 40, until, at about the age of 1,000 years, they go voluntarily upon their last strange pilgrimage down the river Is, which leads no living Martian knows whither and from whose bosom no Martian has ever returned, or would be allowed to live did he return after once embarking upon its cold, dark waters. Only about one Martian in a thousand dies of sickness or disease, and possibly about twenty take the voluntary pilgrimage. The other nine hundred and seventy-nine die violent deaths in duels, in hunting, in aviation, and in war. But perhaps by far the greatest death loss comes during the age of childhood, when vast numbers of little Martians fall victims to the great white apes of Mars. So, he doesn't see any who look like they're very old, and there's not much difference in their appearance from the age of maturity at 40 until their old age at about 1,000 years. At that age, they usually take a voluntary pilgrimage down the, the sacred river Is, and um, no Martian has ever come back from it, no Martian knows where it goes, and if a Martian ever did come back from it, they would probably be killed instantly. Um, only about one Martian in a thousand dies from disease. Maybe 20 make the pilgrimage. And the other 900, uh, 979 die violent deaths from war, from duels, from flying, from any, any number of things. And um, there are also apparently great white apes on Mars which prey upon the little Martians. The average life expectancy of a Martian after the age of maturity is about 300 years, 
but would be near the 1,000 mark were it not for the various means leading to violent death. Owing to the waning resources of the planet, it evidently became necessary to counteract the increasing longevity which their remarkable skill in therapeutics and surgery produced, and so human life has, been, has come to be considered but lightly on Mars, as is evidenced by their dangerous sports and the almost, continually, almost continual warfare between the various communities. There are other and natural causes tending toward a dim diminution of population, but nothing contributes so greatly to this end as the fact that no male or female Martian is ever voluntarily without a weapon of destruction. So, the average life expectancy is about 300, not the 1,000 they can reach, but that's because so many of them die a violent death. And uh, their, their skill in medicine is very great, and that's one of the reasons why their, their longevity is so long, but there's waning resources on the planet, and the competition between them has become fierce. And um, they're, they're almost always at war with each other, and no Martian is ever voluntarily without a weapon. As we neared the plaza and my presence was discovered, we were immediately surrounded by hundreds of the creatures who seemed anxious to pluck me from my seat behind my guard. A word from the leader of the party stilled their clamor, and we proceeded at a trot across the plaza to the entrance of as magnificent an edifice as mortal eye has rested upon. The building was low, but covered an enormous area. It was constructed of gleaming white marble inlaid with gold, and brilliant stones which sparkled and scintillated in the sunlight. The main entrance was some hundred feet in width, and projected from the building proper to form a huge canopy above the entrance hall. There was no stairway, but a gentle incline to the first floor of the building opened into an enormous chamber encircled by galleries. So, <clears throat> the Martians are all ready to pluck John Carter off the mountain, see what's going on with him, but the leader of the party shoes them away. Um, they come across the plaza to a huge, magnificent building built of white marble inlaid with gold and gemstones that sparkle in the sunlight. The entrance is about a hundred feet wide and has a, a slope leading up to it, um, and it opens into an enormous chamber circled by, by viewing seats. On the floor of this chamber, which was dotted with highly carved wooden desks and chairs, were assembled about forty or fifty male Martians around the steps of a rostrum. On the platform proper squatted an enormous warrior heavily lo loaded with metal ornaments, gay-colored feathers, and beautifully wrought leather trappings ingeniously set with precious stones. From his shoulders depended a short cape of white fur lined with brilliant scarlet silk. So on the floor of the chamber, the, the, the base of it, there's a bunch of wooden desks and chairs with about 40 or 50 Martians sitting upon it. And there's a, a dais in the middle with a, a huge Martian who's laden with metal ornaments, gemstones set in leather, feathers, and he's wearing a cape of white fur. What struck me as most remarkable about this assemblage in the hall in which they were congregated was the fact that the creatures were entirely out of proportion to the desks, chairs, and other furnishings, these being of a size adapted to human beings such as I, whereas the great bulks of the Martians could scarcely have squeezed into the chairs, nor was there room beneath the desks for their long legs. Evidently, then, there were other denizens on Mars than the wild and grotesque creatures into whose hands I had fallen, but the evidences of extreme antiquity which showed all around me indicated that these buildings might have belonged to some long-extinct and forgotten race in the dim antiquity of Mars. So John Carter notices something very strange. The chairs and the desks are out of proportion to the Martians. They're much smaller, almost human-sized. So there are apparently some other people living on Mars than the Martians into whose hands he had fallen. Um, the, the evidence of age that he's seen in the buildings makes him think that this must be some, some holdover from antiquity, from times past. Our party had halted at the entrance to the building, and at a sign from the leader I had been lowered to the ground. Again locking his arm in mine, we had proceeded into the audience chamber. There were few formalities observed in approaching the Martian chieftain. My captor merely strode up to the rostrum, the others making way for him as he advanced. 
the chieftain rose to his feet and uttered the name of my escort, who, in turn, halted and repeated the name of the ruler followed by his title. At this time, the ceremony and the words they uttered meant nothing to me, but later I came to know that this was the customary greeting between green Martians. Had the men been strangers, and therefore unable to exchange names, they would have silently exchanged ornaments had their missions been peaceful. Otherwise they would have exchanged shots, or have fought out their introduction with some other of their various weapons. So the leader of the Martian raiding party that John Carter is riding with uh, gets off gets off his horse. He uh, he walks John Carter into the building and just strides right up to the Martian chieftain and the chieftain addresses the Martian raid leader by name and the Martian raid leader addresses the chieftain by name and title. Um, this is John Carter later learns the customary greeting between them is the exchange of names. If they're strangers they exchange ornaments from their, the ornaments that they wear or if that's if they're peaceful. If they're not peaceful, they fire shots at each other from their guns. So, all right, and that's it for tonight. So, we'll continue. Thank you, and until next time.